What's up everyone, this is Dariusz Kalbarczyk, co-founder of MG Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the Angular Master podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Prague, Czech Republic. Head of Engineering at FlowUp, Angular, TypeScript and Web Performance Enthusiast. Ladies and gentlemen, Wojciech Masek. Hi Wojciech, how are you? I'm pretty good, had a very productive day today. Amazing. So for those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself. I am a head of engineering in a small uh, development company in Czech Republic. Uh, we focus mainly on uh, Angular or web applications and uh, in combination with uh, cloud-based applications. So. You know, many clouds, we are Google uh, cloud partners, so we prefer Google, but not exclusively, of course. And uh, we are developing um, Angular applications for clients for quite some time now. It is basically as long as Angular as we know it in the newer versions exist. Uh, I was shipping my first uh, application uh, to production with Angular using a version uh, that was uh, in uh, alpha <laughs> and then we went to beta and then we went to uh, release candidates and it was uh, a lot of fun uh, because those that remember release candidates uh, know what I'm talking about. But since then it was all amazing that uh, you can do the updates pretty easily and uh, not much of uh, breaking changes anymore. So all is fine. How did your adventure in programming begin? I started as a student at the university and uh, since my father was a computer enthusiast, as you can say it, because, you know, I'm from Europe, so uh, uh, there were countries uh, like post-communism, computers were ne- not really a huge thing, and if you wanted something, it would be very expensive. And um, he was one of the uh, one of the people that were enthusiastic and were investing money in it. So from a little kid, I was already amazed by computers. And then I went uh, to study, uh, you can say, computer science, or like it was a joint, uh, like electrician and uh, networking and everything, basically. So I know a little bit of all. And um, I started programming uh, early uh, with assembly, with C, with Java, Java. (laughs) And um, slowly it turned into an obsession where I could, you know, when I, when I see something, I am trying to figure out how it works. So uh, that led into me uh, developing a bunch of uh, uh, small, uh, microprocessors uh, and uh, creating my own kits and then I went to university and there I programmed a lot. Uh, I worked on a Fedora project like Linux for a little bit then I uh, like in a in a university lab and uh, yeah, a bunch of other things and then I started my own company uh, while studying and then they threw me yeah, I was kicked out of the school because I wasn't really paying attention to it anymore. And uh, now it has been my fifth year in that said university where I actually had a lecture on uh, using Angular for advanced uh, information systems. So <laughs> I had I had a very rough and fun path in my life to get into software engineering. Why did you choose Angular? Very good question. I didn't choose it myself. Uh, I somehow, uh, uh, I was stu- somehow stuck with it after one of my friends that he actually started the company with me. There were four of us and uh, the whole company basically uh, was created in a hackathon, like these uh, events where you hack around and create something. So we created uh, something and it was created using the uh, I think it is Knockout from Microsoft, uh, a very old tech, like from today's perspective. 
and uh, it was pretty good like it uh, it was basically my first time using javascript or second maybe because up to that point i you know i knew how to use python c c plus plus java but never javascript and uh, it was fun it was less fun with knockout because it was coffee script and i didn't like it and uh, for some reason like people usually like coffee script i didn't and uh, then uh, we went into AngularJS with uh, CoffeeScript. And uh, then basically overnight, uh, it was rewritten again into new Angular, the alpha version. And uh, since that point, I basically fell in love with TypeScript and uh, everything was like, this is how I imagine it looking and working and the whole... The, the stuff that we currently take for granted, like class-based system and dependency injection, like, like the, it, how it worked back then, I loved it because that was the type of architecture that I expected from a, you know, front-end uh, project. And uh, I did not really like the the whole scope that is global everything. And... What do you like about Angular as your front-end tool of choice? I mentioned the dependency injection and TypeScript, of course. Uh, I'm a big, big fan of both of these uh, choices. Um, and uh, what I then like, really, is uh, the whole... Like, people say about Angular that it is opinionated, which is true. Angular is opinionated, but only in a way where you are still allowed to do your own thing. like. You can still use your own router, and there are cases where people write and use their own file-based router, or you can still use your own state management, uh, whatever else. You can basically change parts, and uh, I like this really much, where there are batteries included in a framework. You can start, you can do your own things if you really want to, but you will always end up in a in a structure or in a project that are very similar and that is like if you would say that why would i as a head of development in some random company choose angular for developing uh, front end i would say it's because uh, uh every time we start a new project or we onboard people on, our, on all the projects it is very similar Everything is very similar. They already know uh, where to look for things. Uh, they already have some kind of feeling for the architecture. Um, so lazy loading is done in the same way. The state management, you know, you pro are probably, you know, in the one, two or three cases uh, switching on a, on a, like different implementations. But even these implementations are very similar. So. You are not really uh, stuck in a in a presence where you would be wandering around uh, trying to onboard people for a long time, and then uh, you know once you onboard someone, you will change a front end library. What are your favorite tech topics on front end development? My favorite tech topics are definitely lazy loading, optimizing for size, which is closely connected to it, but not exclusively because we. You all know that we can optimize for size with things like, I don't know, fonts and uh, images and uh, a lot of other stuff besides code and splitting of the application. And uh, then I really like uh, runtime, uh, runtime performance because uh, that is something that I also do basically daily. Uh, uh, we we optimize uh, for, for uh, performance so uh, yeah, you you had Michael Vladky uh, here a few times, so uh, all all of this uh, that he talks about, uh, usually we we are implementing it, and uh, it's 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 fun. I uh, I really enjoy uh, making applications faster, either to load or to use. You're listening Angular Master Podcast. Listen, code, repeat. Everything you need to know to become an Angular Super Developer. How important are lazy loading and bundle size optimization in production? I would say they are very important. 
And in some of my talks that are connected to the bundle size and lazy loading, I already said that uh, you should at least observe bundle size and uh, your whole performance before you ship the production. Because when you try, when you actually focus after you shipped everything, you are in the state where you cannot really change much or, you know, you have to do all these non non-disruptive uh, um, things first, or it is really hard to, uh, to optimize after you shipped something. And, uh, if you start before then at least, you know, acknowledging some of the things, some of the technical that you can start to prepare or what will come next. Yeah. For example, with Angular, it is pretty easy to do the lazy loading with routers. So you can, you can already know that, okay, even though we don't optimize on routes, we want to in future and you will, uh, you will, uh, put these, uh, put these, uh, let's call it items into your development cycle. So definitely like. Do, do everything you can before you actually ship, because after you ship, you are in a state where it will be very hard to. What do you think about the direction Angular Framework is going in regard to front-end optimization? It is going a very good direction. Uh, things are getting easier, which is amazing. I also like to see when things are not only easier, but also type safe, which is also happening. Uh, a lot of stuff that uh, you could only hack uh, in a uh, like last years uh, are now done properly with dynamic imports and type save, which is very nice. And like, this is not only the, uh, how, how the router, uh, how I load children uh, have changed, but it is basically the fact that, uh, uh, Angular CLI is based on Webpack and Webpack has its own dynamic import, which is very powerful. And, uh, like, again, in some of the talks I do, I go into uh, very specific details on uh, how can you do uh, interesting things with the, uh, with the Webpack Dynamic Import. And uh, I would say that this direction is only going to get better. Uh, often people ask me on how, uh, like, what is my opinion on the web usage of Webpack itself uh, underneath because like there are now, we know that, uh, in 16, there will be probably at least first steps to white or white or be there. Sorry. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that one or, uh, the R respect that was, uh, that was also announced, uh, which is uh, Webpack based. So that is nice. Uh, I think that because they are using the dynamic import in the route, they will have to support this case. So once they support the dynamic import, <laughs> everything is good and uh, we can move on to something else because all applications will work the same. This, this would be amazing we, if there was a seamless migration. And then uh, um, all the other things, uh, the more we decouple from uh, like huge uh, file-based uh, chunking uh, problems that we have because of how, how Webpack works and how basically the whole front-end functions with bundling, um, the better state we we get of um, how applications are loaded. For example, I really like the change of uh, standalone components or standalone everything. I, I think it is, uh, it is a great, uh, a, a great steps, uh, to take to make the applications actually load what they need. Uh, and, uh, I will be glad to see more and more of these. When should people start to optimize? I'm a fan of optimizations. Uh, so, uh, uh, as you, as you might tell, uh, usually uh, I'm the one, um, doing the optimization. So. From my perspective, it is, you know, the sooner the better, but honestly, from the perspective of you know, someone who is, uh, uh, maybe on the management level too, uh, I would say that, um, optimizations are needed when they are no, there are noticeable bottlenecks. And, uh, that's where 
you either have to know what you are doing or have someone who knows what they are doing and uh, start optimizing. And with every optimization, it, it, it should be measurable. And not only measurable, you should uh, be absolutely sure that uh, what you are introducing is actually making an impact. And that is something that we basically, you know, do with up in our everyday work. We first measure, we audit, we, you know, create the, uh, the problem definition and try to exactly identify what is the you know, point of that optimization and then offer a fix for it. We will not blindly just go and, uh, randomly, you know, put something somewhere and uh, then run the application again and say, okay, it is a half second faster. It doesn't work like that. We have to exactly know what you are doing. And uh, you also have to recognize that sometimes the optimization is, you know, bringing benefit or at least not making it worse, but it is maybe not something that uh, will uh, uniquely fix all your problems. Sometimes you need to do 10 or 100 of similar, let's call it small things, and then you see some kind of improvement because otherwise uh, you wouldn't. And you know, th this whole, this whole topic is, is a, it's a very complicated when you, when it comes to nailing down uh, what actually has the biggest impact and what is uh, the most desirable. Uh, usually you could do it in a way where you say, let's do the biggest impact, uh, lowest effort first. This will get you a buy in from the stakeholder, from your boss, from, I don't know, whoever you need to talk to, uh, you will get rid of the technical debt along the way. Uh, they will be glad that they see an, an actual improvement and slowly you en end up in a in a state where there are no more low hanging fruits and you will need to do a proper auditing again, <laughs> which is again, not a bad thing. It's just that, uh, some, some optimizations are harder to land, especially if you are not allowed to break things because you are in production. Are there tools that you use and recommend? I like to recommend, or I like to start even my talks with the tooling section, because without the tools, you cannot measure without the measurements, you don't know what you are doing. So, uh, one that I start with is usually the bundle phobia. If we are talking about bundles, then this, you know, little website called bundle phobia, it's amazing because even if you do not have the, you know, underlying the knowledge of what it actually means, uh, what is it showing you, it will tell you the sizes. And, you know, by the, by the first glance of a look, you can see there are loading times down there with 3G, with 4G. Uh, so you can already tell, okay, if I, you know, use this library over this library or do, do this import, it will have some consequences. So bundle phobia, very good tool. Then there is uh, something that will say, tell you similar stuff in your IDE and that is in import cost plugin, which is for both, uh, WebStorm and, um, uh, visual code, visual studio code, free plugin that will just on the imports tell you how big they are approximately. Of course, it is not something to go by, you know, strictly, but you can have a feeling about, oh, maybe I don't want this whole Firebase imported in the start of my uh, in the start of my module, maybe I will get laser loaded. And we, we actually like think about it this way, because every time, you know, I see something like that, when I come to a new code base, when I see something like that, I have my, you no know, 10 go to uh, imports, uh, which I definitely know, uh, create a, a horribly huge uh, bundles. So I'll just go there, find, for example, a uh, quill editor a rich text editor and I will know, okay, how often do you use Quill in your, uh, in your front end? Oh, we need it just for this admin part. So why is your Quill editor imported in your app module? Well, it makes no sense. It's, it should be, uh, imported dynamically or lazy loaded only for that, uh, for that, uh, route. And there are these things that you can then, uh, 
know, continue with and actually actually split the application. Uh, other tools uh, which will allow you to actually uncover uh, these uh, problems and uh, have a have a good um, feeling about um, I know how we visually my uh, bundles look and I can scroll in and uh, read uh, read the bundle insights and they are two plugin on uh, no, two actual tools one is uh, the webpack bundle analyzer uh, from it it takes the output of the webpack uh, built with angular you can just pass the stats json uh, a flag to the build and it will uh, output a json that you just put into this uh, tool you get the whole visualization of the whole build basically your dist folder everything will be there amazing tool you can really scroll scroll around angular team actually uh recommend something else not the webpack bundle different one i have uh, I've forgotten what is its name, but it is. Uh, it can be found on, in the documentation. The main difference is that uh, Webpack Bundle Analyzer is actually not 100% right. And, you know, let's leave it this way. Uh, you cannot trust it blindly. Uh, for most of the applications or for most of the use cases, it is a good tool to use. Have a look. But you cannot trust the numbers like 100%. Sometimes they are off. Uh, if you want to be 100% sure what is bundled and shipped, uh, there's another tool which is called Bundle Wizard. And this one is actually using the recommended tool under, underneath. And its biggest advantage is that it will work on a served application. So even on the application that is deployed, you can use Bundle Wizard to preview what is imported, uh, like what are the bundles that go through the network. And like as an addition to this, you will also see what code is actually executed. So it will grow, glow green um, green and red, so like the test coverage. It is, it is also called coverage. So this code coverage is there and it will tell you again approximately what is the unused code in your in your application on, or in the application you are observing? And you can take this information, see what the bundles uh, actually glow glow red or orange, and then realize, okay, so maybe parts of these bundles are not executed because they are there is ngif in the template. So this whole component is never bootstrapped and uh, and uh, placed into it or there are these uh, i don't know effects the whole state management is shipped with my uh, initial bundle which is a case of almost every ngrx application i have seen if you are creating global management a uh, global state management then 99 percent of the times uh, you are shipping your whole global state management with your application even if you split into feature models you have to be really careful about how you use them because if they depend on each other, they will be there together. So all of these things come together, and with the with the tools, with the bundle analyzers, uh, you can slowly but steadily identify parts that might be split or uh, taken care of in a different way. Also, the bundle wizard uh, will, if you load a page, for example something that is behind login it will actually allow you to log in first and then run the analysis and uh, then you will have the analysis of all the bundles and uh, everything you see there basically means that this was loaded for that page so suddenly you may realize hmm, even though my main bundle is small let's say something arbitrary 300 uh, kilobytes the shared bundles that i load that I load are 10 megabytes and they anyway need to be there. So I'm even if I have main uh very small, the shared ones can be can be huge. And I've seen this problem in uh again multiple applications. The worst example was uh, where we loaded a list which we expected it will be you know few megabytes and it had 63 shared bundles. So for the display of the list 63 sh shared bundles which were all you know huge size all all in all together almost 20 megabytes 
were loaded just to render a pretty simple list with sidebar. What kind of IDE are you using? I use WebStorm uh, for a long time. I have no idea who, like what led me to using WebStorm in, in the first place, uh, probably because I wanted a real IDE and uh, there was none in the market if you don't count the Visual Studio. And I mean the real Visual Studio, not the code version, because that is uh, pretty young, if you say it like this. Uh, then there was the Atom, there was uh, the Sublime, but they were not IDs, so I wanted an ID. And it really grew close to my heart. Uh, I'm so used to, like, my flow is so used to uh, the WebStorm that I am really a power user. And uh, yeah, I can only recommend it. The All the stuff, you know, people are asking me, how do you handle the refactorings, like when you rename something? Well, I don't, my WebStorm handles that. <laughs> or how do you make sure that it imports correctly? Well, I don't, I have my you know, import restrictions in the web store when it does it all automatically. When you are developing, what are the things you are most interested in and passionate about? Type safety. <laughs> For me, the type safety is the number one priority. And the only, uh, like, if I come into a, into a code base where they uh, don't respect uh, this, uh, I can already tell that it will be one of the first things I will be advocating for. And this this is like that for a long time, even uh, like, again, a few years ago where uh, TypeScript was not really a thing uh, between other frameworks. Uh, let's name them React and Vue. Uh, they were not uh, TypeScript native. Uh, React was even using a different type system back then. And uh, I encountered multiple times where I was basically advocating for uh, for proper typings in, in front-end applications, uh, like on meetups or on conferences, uh, having these discussions and people were not really getting it, like uh, how it helps you to ship more better quality uh, code. And uh, I'm so glad that we are now living in a, in a, in a environment where this is basically a common thing but i, I remember that uh, i used to uh, explain that you know first you have to type your state management because if that is not typed that then uh everything is horrible uh then i'm also uh into uh, typing uh, the backend communication for example like with graphql there is a beautiful link that will allow you to generate all the all the TypeScript models for the schema. Uh, I did my own generator for uh, for Swagger because I was not satisfied with the one that uh, the, there was in the Swagger editor. Um, so yeah, I, I created my own tool there. Uh, nowadays there are many. Yeah, so you can generate the whole SDKs for the for the front end uh, front end backend models. Yeah, that that. Uh, makes me really really glad that it it is a common thing in a in a current applications and it, then all kinds of uh you can say crazy uh crazy stuff uh, when it comes to uh, architecture and uh and uh, lazy loading because if you if you are able to achieve uh, you know, great splits or proper uh loadings or initialization so uh, with architecture, then I'm really early up for it. Uh, if, you, if you let your architecture live in the code and uh, everything is nice with NX, for example, uh, there's nothing better because then everybody can easily see what's happening and how, how it will be distributed. When starting a new project, how do you make sure that you achieve your goals for production ready setup there is a checklist of course <laughs> so we have a checklist and yeah, it is not something fancy it is really just uh you know how to how to generate uh, what to use what to prefer what to already put there i can name few things so uh, generate new projects using nx 
even though, and that is something that I already talked to to uh, like Enix developers, even though you are not planning to use monorepo, use Enix because uh, it is not a monorepo tooling, it is productivity tooling. For me personally, I like we use it in monorepos, of course, but I, I don't really like that advertisement because that makes people think I don't need it. No, you need it. It is it it will make you productive whether you are in a monorepo setup or not. So generate a new project using Enix. Then you can start ex- extracting or you know creating uh, libraries from the start. You can have the um, for example, if you are using translations in your project, you can put the translations into the library and then maybe you will reuse them in a end-to-end tests and you don't have to you know, manually copy-paste everything. Uh, put the models there so multiple uh, projects or multiple libraries can reuse the models. Put the pipes, everything, you know, UI components, you can start doing the proper architecture from the start. Uh, then you put uh, strict ESLint settings there. We are using as a company, as many companies do, very strict ESLint settings. We migrated everything from the TSLint, uh, how it was before. We are again at the beta stage at, as, uh, as we were aware. And uh, I can say that uh, in our ESLint setting, we are already uh, saying that you should prefer to write uh, immutable code. Uh, we don't uh, really allow uh, mutable code. Uh, even like you can, of course, disable this or like uh, locally. But in most of the cases, it is preferred to um, to do it in a, in a functional immutable way. And uh, we really like it if it's done uh, that way. Uh, then uh, we have all um, like I said, typings and uh, um, then some like other common things. But there are also uh, things like uh, one of my talks, which I had uh, recently in India, uh, is uh, that you should really start using TrackBy because TrackBy is basically the uh, the absolute minimum of UI performance. If you are not putting TrackBy into your NG4, you are losing, like probably you are losing a lot of computing power in rendering. Uh, yeah, so again, Tracking uh, if the track bar is used, uh, it, it is a good rule. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of rules there, uh, very strict. And I also say that uh, it is much better if computer is yelling at the programmer than if you are doing it in the uh, in the code review. And of course, yelling is uh, in in a quotes. I don't really yell at people. I'm quite uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually a pretty uh, chill uh, guy. So. Now, th- that is uh, not my case, but uh, I already experience where people are much easier to convince if uh, you give them an explanation, uh, actually, actually uh, point out the uh, pros and cons, and then just uh, put it into the uh, static analysis and don't ever mention it again in some random pull request. You you really want to avoid that. What are some of the limitations of Angular Router when it comes to lazy loading? Angular Router had much more limitations a uh, few months ago than it has now, or few, let's say, a year ago. Uh, now, some of the things have actually been, uh, have been taken care of. One of the really nice things I've seen recently, I don't really know where, it was either some talk or Twitter or something, but uh, if you remember how we used to write uh, the dynamic import and then uh, the module and then M and then, you know, the again, M something module. So you can do that uh, with uh, standalone components right now. You can write the same thing, but with component. Somebody showed uh, that uh, you can actually completely skip the then C dot component part, and you can just uh, put a dynamic import to the component there if you use export default component name. So if you export default your components or pipes or directives, 
it is already much simpler and uh, much less code to write. It is still the same type safe code. It is it is really nice. I like it. And there are also other things that are becoming much easier. For example, uh, many people don't realize it, but the in uh, functional inject that allows us to use the in uh, dependency injection in many other places or uh, or um, code structures uh, will actually allow us to do um, fine grain lazy loading much easier where we don't really need to um, overthink how we structure the modules and uh, put codes uh, codes together so uh, it lives properly you know if you if uh, you do not have a very complicated case uh, of uh, uh, that something is single done and it should it should die well on certain uh, certain routes when you are really just having a case where you need to laser load the route library or initialize a module you can you can achieve uh, great things that will be very simple with uh, with this so um the router is getting less complicated in this which is uh which is a good thing then there is of course uh, yeah, the limitations uh i cannot remember from the top of my head uh what was the last thing i said i wish the router uh uh could do but um i i know that there were some so <laughs> They, they still have uh, they still have some um, things to sort out on the other hand uh, I think uh, they are they are very close uh, to you know being addressed because even stuff that was not able to be addressed uh, in past because uh, of life cycle uh, of the of the route and everything yeah it, for example yeah I now I remember <laughs> Thank you for following my uh, uh, my thoughts. Uh, so there are there is a, a way how you can dynamically create components. And uh, if you imagine that some of your components might rely, as I said, on feature uh, feature stores, mm -hmm. there has been a, a, a case where if you dynamically create with a factory the component that basically has a context and a module. Uh, uh, it would not behave the way that you would actually expect it to behave. Or in other words, it would not behave the way router initializes it or keeps it alive. Why? Because router actually keeps the references to all the modules. So if the module is created, it will never be created again. Uh, this is another case of uh, dynamically creating, uh, creating uh, with factory. If you do this with factory, it will die. The ng on this story will be called. The code will be stripped. Oh, sorry, the runtime will be stripped out. And uh, when you click on that component again, it will again initialize and it will again. Uh, so, long story short, uh, everything was behaving properly, but the feature stores also had feature effects. So each time we open something uh, that was dynamically created, the effects would initialize again. So suddenly you see a lot of requests uh, going back and forth and you're like, oh, what's happening? Well, you have effects like seven times initialized already. Uh, it was it was fun thing to, uh, to encounter and to actually fix because like the fix was copy pasting the piece of code from router, but <laughs> you have to know what's happening. What are some of the best practices for implementing advanced lazy loading strategies in Angular? If we talk about advanced lazy loading strategies, let's name it, uh, let's be specific. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in, in these uh, techniques are, for example, lazy loading uh, in an Angular type. One of my proudest uh, moments uh, that I've spent uh, uh, on a, on a, on a project, uh, is, uh, when I had to figure out how to do something and I was like, actually like, let's try this. Maybe it will work. And it worked. I lazy loaded a third party, a huge library in a pipe. And I was like, this is such a brilliant way of doing it. Let's see 
if uh, this is, you know, mentioned or documented and it wasn't. And I was like, am I crazy? Because of course you will not be like, oh, I'm the only one of, of the first one. I certain that I was not the only one, but it was not a common practice when I was Googling it. And at some point I realized that it actually has a lot of benefits. And uh, one of the key benefits there is that if you lazy load a third party library in a pipe, it will not only lazy load only when it's used, but also only if the content actually needs it. Because imagine that you are lazy loading a uh, highlight JS code, you know, a library for highlighting code, uh, only if there is a code snippet in your template. You know, from backend, it, from the data came, and only if there is a code snippet in the data, the library will be lazy loaded because it is not needed otherwise. You say, okay, but then we are waiting for the you know render time and everything. Not true. We are not. Why? Because of Epic Dynamic Import. We use a uh, uh, we use uh, fancy webpack commands uh, to uh, preload or prefetch uh, prefetch in this example, and uh, the browser will actually prefetch this piece of code, and like the library will already be in the browser memory, but it will not be parsed and executed. So we are still saving a lot of precious uh, browser thread uh, computing power, not uh, not doing stuff that you don't really need. And it can all be cached. So uh, again, a uh, great, great benefit. Also, for the same code snippet, the same output will be reused again. So you know, another benefit. You can even go further and memoize it even more intelligently because we are able to do this with uh, like uh, computed uh, class members pretty easily with decorator, and uh, and so there are there are very very nice things that you can achieve with this. Uh, and I also seen an implementation somewhere again, maybe on Twitter, maybe somewhere else, where people were actually. Uh, injecting services um, via dependency injection, which internally have been uh, having like the API was designed of that service was designed in a way where it already uses observables. So why not defer lazy load um, some kind of uh, code library that needs to be there only if the service is ever initialized or some method is ever called, something is ever subscribed. So these architectural changes in uh, how you how you observe your uh, your code uh, can can really bring uh, huge benefits into uh, how how application can be split. Because in the end, you can always create the wrappers uh, around existing things, and there is also something we already did where we has to optimize a huge dashboard with um, charts and uh, there has there have been many charts and I guess you know most of us have already seen dashboard with charts so you can imagine that you know, it is configurable and users can have literally anything there and uh, it was not in a you know scale of human life possible to properly lazy load everything so we had to now uh, we had to create a more creative uh, way. The more creative way was using library named ngxd, XD, and uh, that allowed us to create a wrapper. So we basically generated wrappers for all of the components. Um, it had the same inputs as the component for the you know type safety and everything, so it doesn't uh, yell. Uh, and internally it would do something like dynamically load the actual component and place the reference into the viewport. Everything works as expected. There were no other refactoring uh, efforts needed, maybe besides the one uh, that, uh, you know, if there's something uh, dynamically importing, uh, sorry, uh, we are dependency injection injecting the 
the feature uh, feature store uh, that was a little bit cumbersome but we solved it and you know you will probably do now you know this <laughs> and uh it was it was pretty uh easy and uh and uh functioning way of how to how to do this and i would say most of these uh advanced techniques are uh pretty straightforward if you if you remember that in angular we can still work with streams observables even promises because like most of the time oh the dynamic import is promised so yeah you can do this uh with already existing uh, infrastructure what are some of the traits of, of using advanced lazy loading strategies in Angular? And how do you weigh those traits of against the benefits? Biggest trade off uh, undocumented. Uh, all of this uh, that I'm saying is either undocumented uh, architecture that you do, even though everyone knows that uh, pipes can return observable. You know, you are basically leveraging this and returning an observable of some uh, thing that will turn uh, uh, promise into uh, into observable, and that observable will map using that library and the value input into something output of that library. So it is not a very straightforward uh, stuff uh, if you if you really say it out loud on the other hand if you open such a uh, such a pipe and uh, like have a have a good read and uh, look at these four or five lines that might be there uh, you are able to understand it pretty quickly even more if somebody did a good job of extracting the business logic of this somewhere else and then just you know properly uh, putting these few lines together in that pipe so pipe only does the dynamic import and uh, value mapping as you would expect then the only downside you have to realize is that maybe if you don't want to subscribe in that pipe you will want to uh, chain it with a sync again some people like it I do I like chaining, uh, chaining pipes some people don't uh, then you can, uh, I don't know, uh, subscribe in component or uh, use uh, Rx let, for example, like let directive in uh, in your template. Everything will work ex as expected. Uh, so this is uh, this is one of the trade offs uh, that it's undocumented or you have to document it yourself. Um, other trade-off is that uh, if you really lazy load everything like blindly and your application will you know basically be an empty one and everything will uh, be dynamically imported then I, I don't know in most of the cases you are not uh, doing yourself any favors you are basically over engineering something that shouldn't be done that way uh, that that brings us to when should people optimize well if you load the application and you see that there are things as I mentioned uh, text editor loaded on a initial load even though you will not need text editor at least you know for another three or four clicks then it shouldn't be there so yeah the, the, then can the, then another technique which I call uh lazy load everything that is one click away so <laughs> so if stuff is one click away um you know try to do something with it um it doesn't have to be loaded because you know there is a, a human or some kind of interaction needed to to do that and uh, a great example for this is um for example model window if uh, you are uh, using uh, different kinds of uh, complicated logic in dynamic model windows or sidebars or you know any kind of hidden content that needs to already be there because it is animated in you know, or something like that try to do it in a way where you actually wrap things around and uh, only after that interaction the whole um the whole component service or 
module is is loaded and it can be achieved with a pretty smooth transition with um, some kind of skeleton is there and it will drop in for example i remember that we did uh, we did an implementation where a uh, whole uh, whole functionality of how uploading documents uh, in this uh, sidebar will not uh, be there unless you actually start drag and dropping something. What are some of the future directions for lazy loading in Angular? And how do you see it evolving over the time? It is evolving slowly. Uh, it is not uh, as fast as with other uh, Angular parts. Uh, like to mention a few, we see that uh, forms and the typings and everything that is happening, you know, sig signal binding. And so this is, this is evolving pretty fast now. Uh, yeah, other parts, so the CLI with the multiple built uh, um, techniques uh, or technologies uh, are, is also evolving. Uh, lazy loading itself in Angular it is not evolving that much. And uh, you can say that, okay, the dynamic, uh, sorry, the inject, uh, callable inject was a pretty uh, a huge step. Yes, it was. But it was more like a, a accidental step for the lazy loading. But I, I don't really think like this was intentional, like it will unlock us in so many great uh, lazy loading potential. Oh, it like people knew that it will allow uh, better tree shaking or uh, standalone components to, you know, be uh, much uh, more standalone, <laughs> let's call it this way, uh, or parts of the application uh, like interceptors and uh, outguards uh, to be much simpler and uh, probably even smaller. Uh, but I I didn't really uh, think of it in a way where this is the lazy little improvement or that Angular is uh, doing something uh, special in this field. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying it's, it's a it's a bad thing. We had uh, we had the router based lead loading uh, for so long that I don't even know people that uh, don't use it. Like of course if you have if you are maintaining a horribly uh, old application then maybe you still have some of the old stuff. I'm not even sure if it's not that, like removed. So I, I have no idea how, uh, what went there. And um, I'm, I'm really glad that we were early in a stage where it was uh, the new norm. Like it was normal for all of the, uh, all of the people to do it like this. And uh, it, it was basically more you can say that it was more of an opt out like no i don't want blaze loading for some reason which is you know, there might be valid reason uh, one of the valid reasons is uh that you are building for uh, application like for desktop or for mobile where you expect the whole project to be bundled together and you don't want to uh, have unexpected uh, cases of uh, things are not loaded uh, or do it manually. So yeah, there are valid reasons to uh, completely opt out. But on the other hand, it is still easy to do it in a lazy loading first and then start to uh, handle these cases. Uh, yeah. So uh, my answer to this uh, question, uh, how do you, uh, I see evolving it uh, over time, is uh, in a small steps, in the places where uh, we expected uh, some kind of improvement or in a way where the improvements were just given by something else you know like we went from uh webpack 4 to webpack 5 so suddenly all new things were unlocked we went to uh callable inject we will go to maybe different uh build system maybe we'll go to um I don't know, completely different uh, metadata structure of router. I, I have no idea at this point, but I'm excited to see these improvements. Now I have some non-technical questions for you. What kind of person is Wojciech? How do you see yourself? 
People usually tell me that I'm a very cal calm person. I can agree. I see myself as a calm person. Uh, I also see myself as a, a very technical person. I have this uh, weird, uh, maybe not for us, not weird. Like if you are a technical person, it's not uh, weird for you, but it is definitely weird for others that you are uh, thinking uh, and the, all your thoughts are in a very specific direction. Uh, I'm also very uh, analytical, so uh, I tend to go very deep into problems. Uh, also, I don't feel comfortable when I don't understand something. So if I don't understand something, I would rather skip the topic than talk about it. Do you have some hints for us regarding self-organization? It is uh, cool nowadays to say that uh, you are you are the ADHD uh, kind. Uh, and uh, I, well, let, let's put it this way. I also think that I am. I don't have this diagnosed, but uh, nah, my uh, close circle of friends and family can relate to this a lot because uh, I am constantly uh, struggling with uh, with attention, and uh, that means that my work life needs to be needs to be organized. One of the first rules I have is that what isn't in the calendar doesn't exist. So if you uh, if you don't put the meeting, and thank you for <laughs> putting this one in the calendar. If you don't put the meeting in the calendar, it will not happen. And um, yeah, even my morning, you know, clock I'm setting uh, based on what I what I see there in the evening. Uh, then there are things that uh, I constantly have to take notes uh, for uh, for little things like just to just to park the attention because uh, sometimes things will pop up in the head and uh, I just don't want to get distracted so I need to write it down or do something with it and usually the writing it down helps a lot because then I'm able to you know, leave it and uh, return to it and in the code uh, in the code and development this is usually you know me creating an issue or writing a to do or fix me command into into code base but as soon as i do that i'm able to mentally leave it there which is uh, amazing that i discovered this uh, <laughs> on myself uh and um yeah all the all the other things that people do i'm i'm not really sure what what works uh, for me, maybe it uh, will work for you too. And, uh, try to try, try to focus in a in a way where you are really um, really hard on yourself. Like be the be the hardest bo boss you can you can be to yourself uh, in this uh, productive uh, time. Because if you let go, um, then you know there is nothing. Uh, easier to then you know just forget it and now what, what i'm talking about just the few, the small things like you know don't go on social media when you have to do something else just that's that urge is strong but it uh, cannot be allowed at least not for me maybe you are able to uh, to go with this i am not even if i open twitter suddenly i'm you know reading through a lot of technical and maybe important stuff for my work but i could be doing this some you know sometime else not uh, uh not waiting for some meeting and then forgetting to join on time what's about your work-life balance do you have some hints for us my work-life balance i would say that it is pretty good now it wasn't that good uh, not so long ago i have a home office um like i already said that i'm uh I'm head of engineering in this small company. Our offices are actually in Brno, which is the second largest city in Czech Republic. But I live in Prague. Uh, I'm visiting Brno. I, I try to visit often, but of course I'm not going to office uh, every day, not even every week. And uh, I'm basically sitting in this you know, flat uh, with my three screens and uh, two computers and... <laughs> Uh, so work-life balance is a real thing that I have to actively maintain. 
one of the things I found it's uh, it's helping me uh, is uh, cooking my own food. So I cook my own dinner, and uh, uh, since I'm not very hungry during the day, uh, it usually comes into a, a point where it is like 5 p.m. I'm hungry and I need to go cook, and uh, that ends my work day. So. <laughs> You know, do whatever with whatever you want with taking this information, but it helps me. And uh, yeah, find find some uh, kind of hobby for me. The cooking is one. I also like to make drinks. Like I actually have a home bar with collection of uh, a lot of uh, alcoholic beverages, which which I can uh, you know mix. I do my own syrups. I uh, do yeah I. I created my own coffee liquor from uh, some Columbia plant that I bought. My last question for today. Which movie would you recommend to our listeners? I like to watch movies. When I was young, I watched a lot of them. I, you could say that there is this you know, database list of the greatest movies and maybe except some of them I've seen it all. And uh, the movie that I... To this day, I think it is the one that I really like the most. Uh, it's more of a recent one. It is not that old, and it is called uh, Boyhood. It is the film that was the funny thing is or interesting thing about this movie is that it was uh, um, created over a period of twelve years, where for the for the full twelve years they were. You no know, working with the with the actors and they are actually aging in that movies like from kids to teenagers and like everything is there and I know this sounds like a cliche it is not you know why because the director actually made it in a way where he stripped all of the cliches out there is no first kiss there is no first alcohol there is no first weed there is you no know, no first things there it is just the life the divorce of the parents the going to the university but not the first day there is like actual struggle in a you know few weeks or something it is very interesting movie a massive thank you to our incredible podcast guest Wojciech your insights and energy truly elevated the conversation and I am so grateful for your time you spent with us I'm stoked to have you back for another fantastic episode in the future thank you